It is a conflict that since the turn of the century has cost over 300,000 lives and displaced over 2 million people. Murder, rape and torture amid allegations of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. It began as rebel groups took up their positions in the Darfur region of Western Sudan, accusing the country's Arab-dominated government of Omar al-Bashir of marginalising the region and oppressing its people. The army fought back, joined as well by the infamous Janjaweed militia, often accused of riding into villages, killing the men and raping the women. Although the UN raised the alarm over the situation in Darfur as early as 2003, it wasn't until 2007 that the government there accepted a peacekeeping force with the aim of protecting civilians and ensuring humanitarian aid was delivered. Initially, the United Nations African Union hybrid operation in Darfur, comprising nearly 26,000 personnel. <laughs> As you all know, we are not opposed to the presence of UN troops because they are already here. When it comes to Darfur, in the wake of the Abuja Accords, it's clear that the African Union is in charge of the peacekeeping mission. The UN are here as a logistical, financial and technical backup to help the African Union do its job. In 2009, a first international arrest warrant was issued by the International Criminal Court, accusing President Omar al-Bashir of a series of charges, including that of genocide. Despite that, he won, though, two more elections, critics say in a questionable way. But then, in 2019, after more than 30 years in power, he was ousted amid mass protests against his regime. The country is still being run by a transitional government made up of members of the military and the protest movement. Omar al-Bashir himself was sentenced in December to two years in jail for corruption. In Darfur itself, although the violence is at a far lower level, it is far from stopped. And in this extremely rare report, access to the region were almost impossible for years. Bastien Renwi and Elodie Cousin revisit Darfur for France 24. Many of the women at this displacement camp in Al-Fasha have similar stories of brutal violence done to them by the army and militia. They are gathered today to receive money from the World Food Programme. How much do you want? For a household of three people. I'll give you 2,100 pounds. Recount the money. Tahwa is 21 years old. She fled ethnic violence that destroyed her village in 2003, when war first broke out in Darfur. Since then, she depends on the money from the United Nations to survive. How much are tomatoes? 10 pounds per kilo. OK, so give me two kilos. We have enough to buy what we need to eat and drink, but not enough for all our other needs. Since the beginning of the conflict, hundreds of thousands have fled their villages for the safety of big cities like Al-Fasha, the capital of North Darfur. This camp has grown to the point where it's now a city within a city. Tahwa lives here with her mother, her sister and their children. They have survived Omar al-Bashir's brutal policy of extermination. The former president now stands accused of genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity by the International Criminal Court. The Janjaweed, a government-backed nomadic Arab militia, chased native African tribes from their lands. When the Janjaweed came, they targeted our village. They burned and killed the villagers. They took our goats and stole everything we had. It was the government that gave them arms. They were authorized by the government to do this. 
They stole our money and they stole our land. It was a government strategy to displace people, to force them to leave and give our land to others. Far from Tahua, peace talks have been organized in the capital and abroad to put an end to the 17-year conflict. Here, they still meet to talk about how to end the enduring violence. Peace will be possible if all the weapons are collected from all the militia. The government must be strong. It must gather all the militia and the other movements and take their arms. The people of Darfur have been targeted ever since the creation of Sudan. From that moment, we have always been marginalized. What happened in 2003 and continues to this day is a genocide. It is ethnic cleansing, a crime against humanity. All of Darfur has suffered, but one region more than others, Jabal Mara. This mountain range is the last bit of rebel-held territory, and we hope to meet those defending it. Three hours into our journey, we see what appears to be the remains of a mosque. The village it was part of has been destroyed. No one dares to return. This is the village of Shingale Tobaya. It was attacked in 2003, when the conflict started in Darfur. They burned the village, burned the mosque, and stole everything. Everywhere we go, we pass settlements destroyed by the army. Six hours after leaving Al Fasha, we approach Jabal Mara. But the military blocks our way. They refuse to let us meet the rebels of the Sudanese Liberation Army. But one comes to meet us in this abandoned building after dark. We are still suffering murders, rapes, torture, arrests, and kidnappings. Those in power are still doing this. We demand the disarmament of the militias, be it the Janjaweeds or others. We demand the removal of those who stole the lands from displaced people. All Dafuri speak about them. The Janjaweed, a militia created by Omar al-Bashir to put down all opposition in the region. In 2013, they were absorbed into the armed forces and became known as the Rapid Support Forces. Their leader, the infamous General Hemti, is now the second most important man in the country. He likes to portray himself as a leader who brought peace to Sudan. Sudan is now safe and stable, and we will keep going in the same direction. As the military council, we're not holding on to power. We don't want the power. Yet Hamiti's soldiers are accused of crimes against humanity by civil rights groups, like the massacre in Jenaina in December last year. We decide to go to Janaina, to Kendrick IDP camp. Between 29 and 31st of December, 72 people were killed here. More than 100 were wounded and hundreds of houses burned. It began as a dispute between IDPs and young members of an Arab tribe. One of the Arabs was stabbed to death. In this amateur video, a man from the same tribe calls for revenge. Army officers appear to be encouraging him, demanding the crowd to listen. Oh, 
The next day, Min came looking for revenge. This is the first time Abdul Hamid has been back to the place of the attack since his brother was killed in front of their house. He was shot in the leg. He was outside the house when they attacked us again. I tried to bandage the wound so he could run away with us. The women stayed here while we ran, but my brother didn't make it. They shot him in the head, in the chest, and cut off his legs. Those responsible were members of the government, Janjaweed, and our neighbors, the Arab tribe. Fearing a new attack, residents of the camp fled. Abdul Hamid lives with his family in a school in the middle of town. Almost 40,000 people were forced to find temporary shelter. Many live outside, without provision for basic needs. If the government did its job, it would provide us with food and food security. If we're uncertain about having food, citizens can't continue to live to build shelters. After the death of his brother, Abdul Hamid is determined to get justice. He has an appointment this morning with a lawyer who provides advice to families of victims, free of charge. You have to tell me precisely what happened in the camp, at what time, and what you saw. I want you to tell me everything, so I can help you. Not a single member of the security forces defended us. We learned after the attack that it was orchestrated by the government's security services. All of it was planned. It's impossible for us to get justice other than through international organizations. Like most here, these men no longer believe in local justice. They hope instead for action from the Prime Minister or the International Criminal Court. And the lawyer's human rights work doesn't sit well with local authorities. We have been threatened by militia, as well as the security forces. Security forces, such as the army, the police, or others. They asked us why we are investigating. We hoped to put these accusations to the local authorities, but were denied access. We decided to get back on the road and try again in Nyala, the economic capital of Darfur. Once there, we are alerted by human rights defenders of gunshot victims arriving at the hospital. They'd been at a wedding at an IDP camp when there was a burst of gunfire. The two men were guests. We were at a wedding celebration when three or four men appeared and opened fire on us. Some escaped and managed to save their lives. Others stayed and were hit by gunfire. Those who attacked us, they were Arab militias. They fired and they just left. Similar accusations. IDPs identifying Arab militia. After a quick examination, the doctor requests for an X-ray to know the extent of the injuries. Uh, he was hit by a bullet in the right arm. The bullet entered here, it's very clear, and it exited here. We receive all sorts of injuries. 
gunshot wounds, stab wounds, or blunt force trauma. These are frequent cases at the hospital in Yala and throughout Darfur. Eight people died in the attack, and at least 20 were wounded. The next morning, the regional governor visits the town where the marriage took place. We tried to meet him. He is escorted by police and the rapid support forces, the militia that terrifies the residents we've spoken to. He refuses to speak to us and orders us to leave. We head to the camp anyway and meet a camp manager who's keen to show us the place of the attack. They attacked the groom's house. Two militiamen arrived here. One was there, and the other was here. Then they started shooting at the people there. The groom finds ammunition shells everywhere in his garden. They killed our relatives. We tried to help victims, but we failed. Everyone here is really sad. We're depressed. A few hours earlier, the governor promised justice, but the IDPs don't believe it. They identify members of the Rapid Support Forces, who, among others, provide protection for the governor. We are certain that the people who came and attacked the people at the party are militants of the old regime who continue to support al-Bashir. They were armed by him and now they are still free and above the law. Since the fall of al-Bashir's regime until now, we IDPs are not free. We haven't seen a single change. The fallen regime, its mentality is still rooted in the military. The country's transitional government put in place after the fall of Omar al-Bashir is still dominated by military officers that were close to him. And most of us tell us that as long as these men remain in power, the violence will continue. Bastien Renoui and Elodie Cusin revisiting Darfur for France 24. Well, that's all from this week's edition. Don't forget, of course, you can catch it and all the previous editions as well on our website at france24.com. Thanks very much for watching. More news coming up shortly.